I'm Geraint. Uh, I run Signal Smith Audio along with my partner, Yelena. Uh, she wears a few different hats. Uh, most recently, head of personnel development. And by personnel, I mean this happened five days ago. So if I fall asleep in the middle of my own talk, just shake me awake gently and I'll continue. I'm here to talk about reverb. Uh, reverb is one of my favorite effects, both to use and to write. But reverbs have a bad reputation for being a bit tricky to write, and I don't think that's fair. So I'm going to go through a design today, which is one possible design, which I think is quite simple and intuitive, hopefully. And I also think it's friendly and robust, as in it's easy to configure correctly as long as you understand the principles. So just click things together, and it should just work. Um, I'll be explaining the core concepts as sort of you know these signal flows, the diagrams like this, uh, and the two basic blocks we'll be using are delay lines and a mixing matrix. If you aren't familiar with what a matrix is, don't worry. For this talk, a matrix is a function which takes in multiple inputs and adds those together in different ways to produce multiple outputs. An example might be a mid-side encoder. You take in left and right, and you output the sum and the difference. That's a simple matrix. Uh, for a mixing matrix, we treat each set of sam one sample from each channel, and then sort of put it through the matrix, and we get one sample for each output channel. An orthogonal matrix is a matrix where the total energy of the output always matches the total energy of the input. You don't need to know how to construct this, right? We're just going to use some stuff off the shelf. Um, but this property of preserving energy is going to be really useful. So keep an eye out for that. I'll also be showing some example C++ code so you can see what it could look like in practice. We won't be constructing everything from scratch. We'll assume you have some kind of delay class where you can write samples in and read samples out. Uh, the example code get configured for the sample rate, and then we'll process it sample by sample. Uh, yeah, all this code is going to be available on GitHub, and if you want to have a closer look. And it does compile and run. In fact, it makes all the audio examples. So hopefully, you can all hear this kind of audio example. Great. So let's get started. Firstly, what is a reverb? Artificial reverberation is a pretty wide field with lots of different use cases. So we're going to take a pretty simple definition. A reverb creates a sense of space by creating a diffuse, long-lasting sound from a short input. Hopefully, that's not too controversial. Uh, there are loads of ways to achieve this, but two pretty common ones are convolution and the feedback delay network. Uh, they have their advantages and disadvantages. We're going to take the feedback kind of path. You can make a decent-sounding reverb with low CPU and a pretty simple design. So here is a feedback loop. I can play this little animation. The input signal gets sent through a delay. The delayed signal heads to the output, but it's also fed back round and added to the input. This means that the signal travels round in a loop, producing a series of echoes from a single input pulse. There are a few variations, like you know, where the output's taken from, where the gain is. The gain is here to make sure that the signal dies away each time it goes through the loop, so you get a a series of reducing echoes. Here's what it sounds like. Oop, come on. So you can hear there's a very regular echo pattern there. It's not really a reverb, um, but it's the, it's the bones of one. Here's how we could write this in code. So we decide how many milliseconds our delay should be, how much it should reduce each time we go round, and then calculate that delay in samples when we have the sample rate. And then when you're, ooh, when you're processing feedback loops, it, you have to do it in a weird order. You have to start with reading from the delay line. And then you have to multiply by the gain, add it to the input, and then write the results to the delay line. And then the output's just from the delay. Um, normally, you process these signal flows intuitively left to right. We've got an arrow here that's going the wrong way, which is what makes it complicated. But uh, yeah, so this is a simple feedback loop. Here is a multi-dimensional, multi-channel feedback loop. 
So I've got different colors here, and you can see that the different channels have different delay times. Great. Uh, yep, here's how you might write that in code. Um, it's the same as the previous one, except instead of taking one sample at a time, in this code, we're taking four samples at a time. Um, and then we're outputting four samples. So that's how we've organized this code. Hopefully, you should be able to adapt this to whatever framework or whatever it is you're using. But this shows the principles. And now, instead of a single delay time, we have a bunch of delay times, a bunch of delay lines. And when we process it, we have little for loops. So for each channel, we read a delay, put it in the array, multiply by the gain, add it to the input, write it to that specific delay for that channel. So here's what that sounds like when we, uh, when we put a pulse through that. So it's a bit more complex, uh, which is good, because we don't want these uh, clearly repeating patterns to try and make a reverb. Um, but it's still, you know, it doesn't get, it's not very reverby. Uh, at the moment, every channel is just picking up the echoes from itself. So they're all running independently, each channel. It would be really neat, right, if we could pick up echoes from other channels as well. So here is where the mixing matrix comes in. What we do is uh, after the gain, we put in a matrix which blends all the different feedback paths together. So channel one will now pick up echoes from channels two, three, and four as well. Uh, this is a really simple modification to the code. So here's how you do that. Oh, sorry, I'll show the animation. Yeah, so you can see as the feedback echoes pass through the mix matrix, they get redistributed amongst all the channels. And this means that the complexity builds up over time. So you get this very complex result, which we didn't get before. Uh, this is simple to do in code. So when we have our delayed signal, we just apply some kind of matrix. This is the off-the-shelf matrix I talked about. You can find code examples everywhere, but they are also in the GitHub uh, repo that accompanies this presentation. And yeah, here's, let's have a listen to that. So. So you can hear as that complexity builds up, it starts to form a slightly more continuous sound. That's cool, right? It's almost starting to sound a bit like a reverb. Hang on. Because at this point, it is very tempting to mix the channels as much as possible and put a bunch of other stuff inside the feedback loop to try and get this diffusion to go as, as quickly as we can. And there are some interesting designs here. Um, they work. They often require careful tuning. Uh, you know, sometimes you want the delay time short so that it blends faster, goes around the loop. You want it longer because that gives you less obvious repeating patterns. And so there are good things here. There's the, the, the ring or the Toro's figure of eights can all be sort of understood in this pattern. But it's tricky. It's a hard thing to get a feedback loop to produce a diffuse, long-lasting sound. But we don't have to do it. So our original properties we wanted, where well, we wanted a diffuse and long-lasting sound, just the ordinary plain feedback loop has handled the, uh, the long-lasting bit fine. So we could just separate out the two concerns. We're going to have two stages. First, we're going to produce a diffuse sound, and then we're going to repeat it with the feedback loop. And now we are onto what I think is the, the main problem in writing these algorithmic reverb, these feedback delay reverbs, which is we need a really good diffuser. A diffuser should sort of smudge the sound as much as it can without adding too much of its own timbre. And a really useful concept here is the all-pass filter. All-pass filters have a, a flat frequency response, so whatever frequencies you put in, those frequencies come out with the same energy, but they might come out later, different phase. Um, in reverb designs, this is what you often see, something like this. 
is a classic Schroeder all pass filter. I'm not actually a fan of these. I think they're a little unintuitive, among other things. I could prove to you mathematically that this produces an all pass filter with a flat response, but I'm not sure it's that easy to just see or definitely come up with yourself. And it gets worse when you start using higher order things or you start stuffing them inside each other, which you need to do to overcome some of the more technical drawbacks. So we're not going to use them, right? No Schroeder's here. But in the single channel case, <laughs> this would be a bit of an awkward choice because we don't really have many other options for all pass filters. In the multi channel case, we have a bit more variety. But first, we need to define what a multi channel all pass actually is. So the idea of flat frequency response passing through all frequencies to minimize coloration is a good place to start. Let's phrase it slightly differently. Let's say that the total energy of the output over time must equal the total energy of the input. Come on. There we are. I don't know why that's highlighted. Um, yeah, so for a single channel all pass, this is equivalent to the flat frequency response. But this definition generalizes nicely into the multi channel case. And Compared to the single channel case, we have a slightly wider range of basic building blocks available. Um, let's look at a few examples. You might have noticed that this energy preserving thing kind of reminded you a bit of what I talked about at first with the orthogonal matrix. And yeah, uh, an orthogonal matrix is a type of multi dimensional all pass, multi channel all pass. So oh, let's play this animation first. So you can see. This is sort of mixing the channels together, and all the echoes from one get spread to the other. But if this is an orthogonal matrix, such as Hadamard, which is a maximum amount of mixing you can do and can be done pretty efficiently, uh, then this is energy preserving. Great. Another thing you can do is multi channel delays, which we've also seen before. So each channel just gets delayed separately by a different amount. This preserves the total energy. Hopefully, that's pretty intuitive. And there's other stuff we can do. You can flip things, turn them upside down by minus one. Um, and there's, there's loads more complicated ones. There are feedback based multi channel ones. You can do single channel all passes to one channel at a time, or yeah. But actually, the two <laughs> and a bit things we've just highlighted are enough to create a really good diffuser. So let's do it. Uh, the, the pattern we're going to use is we're going to create a diffusion step, which is a multi-channel delay. Then we flip some polarities, just you know, make sure that it's different each time between if you have multiple stages. Um, and then we put a Hadamard mixing matrix on. So, so you can see how that works. Um, from this point out, I apologize that sometimes when it says flip polarities, it also shuffles the channels around. Uh, that's from an earlier version of the presentation. I didn't have time to fix it. Shuffling is optional, does no harm. Um, but yeah, you can see how this works. You get a, a, a synchronized set of echoes coming in. It desynchronizes them. And then the Hadamard matrix mixes channels together, so you end up with more echoes than you started with. Let's just watch that again. So synchronized echoes, desynchronized echoes, shuffling and inversion, and then more echoes after the mixing. Uh, yeah, so we can just repeat this. Because every time you do this, you end up with, well, here, four times more echoes than you started with. If you do this enough times, that just builds up the echo density. Um, echo density is the number of distinct echoes per second. And once you get to uh, between 2,000 to 4,000, something like that, um, they start to blend together into a continuous uh, sound, smooth sound, uh, which is kind of, so that's our goal. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's just listen to this. So this is uh, a four-channel diffuser, as in the diagram. And we've just done three diffusion steps. And the delays are chosen randomly, but it's just the same step three times. So here is a click. It's a slight grain to it. Um, to get it smoother, 
you can either add more diffusion steps, so that was three, you can have six or whatever, or you can increase the number of channels. So here is an eight channel, four step diffuser, so eight channels and then four diffusion steps. That's quite a nice um, So yeah, you still need to choose the number of channels you're working with and the number of diffusion steps, but it's pretty easy to get a smooth diffusion out of this algorithm and to just say, oh, I want it to be better, I'll do more of it. It's very straightforward to just increase the quality of this diffusion. Here's how that might look like in code. Um, I'm going to have to zoom out for this. So apologies if you're a pure mathematician. Just um, close your eyes, it'll be over soon. Um, yeah, so we have, for each step, we have how long the delays are in samples. We have an array of delay lines. And we have just a little array saying whether we're flipping the polarity for that channel. Um, when you get the sample rate, you randomly pick. I'll explain what this is about later. Um, but basically, you can randomly pick your delay times between naught and whatever it is, 60 milliseconds, which is the length of your diffusion step. Um, yeah, you just set up your delay line, choose whether to flip your polarity. That's it. And so here's our process function. Um, yeah, so we write our inputs into the delays. We read our delayed signals out for each channel, optionally flip some polarities, depending, and then we apply a Hadamard mixing matrix. And then our actual diffuser, we just have an array of diffusion steps. That's it. And we configure them with the sample rate. We just pass them through, sample by sample, through all the steps, and that's it. That's our diffuser. Uh, so here, we've specified the total amount of diffusion. Say you're like, oh, 200 milliseconds is how long I want my diffuser to be. Uh, and if there are five stages, then that'll be 40 milliseconds per step. So all the delays in each step will be between 40, 0 and 40 milliseconds. Uh, if any of this isn't making sense, do yell at me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's, um, I mean, that's, Actually, kind of it. Uh, in terms of the multi-channel all pass, there is one thing I want to note, which is that we've started with you know maybe one or two channels, and we've duplicated them, or in some other way produced uh, you know four or eight or more channels, and then we've put it through these diffusion steps, which are all all passes. So we've got this multi-dimensional all pass. At some point, we do have to mix down to a stereo output. And at that point, it stops being an all pass, technically. Um, but that's not a problem as long as the phase response we've created through those filters, through this diffuser, is you know, interesting and unpredictable enough that we can't hear the patterns. Um, but this means that we don't want to duplicate, mix down, duplicate, mix down a lot, right? Once you're in a multi-channel signal, you want to keep in that multi-channel world um, to keep using that good all-pass diffusion. Um, and what I mentioned earlier, choosing delay times. So if your diffuser is 40 milliseconds long, you might want to, you could just choose them randomly, each delay time for each, within each diffusion step, is random between 0 and 40. A neat pattern you can also use is you chop this up into equal segments, and then each channel takes a delay time from a different segment. So if you've got eight channels, 40 milliseconds, I've got a math degree, I can do this, five millisecond chunks. Um, and so that's what we saw earlier. You can, you can see the code for do this, like three lines. Um, but this means that the diffusion is still kind of equally spaced but also still random. Uh, this is a similar pattern to, if anyone's familiar with the velvet noise kind of uh, reverb diffusers, except this is a multi-channel thing, and that's single channel. But um, yeah, so this is a neat way that you can choose the delay times for your diffusion steps, because it guarantees a certain amount of smoothness while still being random. Uh, there's also no reason that your diffusion steps all have to be the same length. So here's a really long diffuser. Right? This is also a bit of demonstration of how good this diffuser can be, because this is diffusing by 
again, maths, one and a half seconds. Is that right? Um, yeah, and so each diffusion step has its delays, eight channels of delays between zero and 300. And it sounds like this. Um, the total diffusion here is one and a half seconds, and it's dis distributed equally between the steps. You could arrange it like this. So you have a short diffuser, and then one that's twice as long, and twice as long, and twice as long. And this sounds, I think, a little bit better. The difference is really subtle. Um, I'll show you a graph. So the difference is that uh, if you use this kind of doubling pattern, it, the diffuser it comes in slightly earlier, and it's more even in volume through the period of diffusion. But I mean, as I said, it's easy to get something good out of this. It doesn't matter. You know, it's not the end of the world if you just do something else. It's very, this is a robust design, so almost whatever decisions you make, the small ones don't matter, as long as you understand the basic principles of what we're doing. So, we have a multi-channel diffuser, and we have a multi-channel feedback loop. Let's stick them together. So here's our combined design. From left to right, we take our input, we split it into, say, eight channels. I'd recommend at least eight if you want like a high quality thing. You can build it out to four, depending on your CPU requirements. But let's say eight. OK, start with your input. Duplicate to eight channels. Diffuse, which is a delay, invert, shuffles optional. Delay, invert, Hadamard. Delay, invert, Hadamard. Da -da, da -da, da -da. And then we send that multi channel signal through into the feedback loop. So here's an example of what that sounds like when we send a click through it. Oop, hopefully, come on. If you can hear that. So that's pretty smooth, I think, um, particularly for a design which. Uh, you can look at the code. The actual meat of this reverb is about 150 lines. Um, and that's, I think, pretty cool. Um, and this is not that many diffusion steps, and it's eight channels. So you can just crank this up. Um, let's, I haven't got the code for this, but it's on GitHub. Uh, let's try it with some other inputs. So here's a little funky drum loop. and then stick that through the reverb. That's pretty smooth. Here's a bit of piano. And then through the reverb. Yeah, so this is a pretty minimal reverb design, and there are lots of ways to extend it. I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail, just sketch out a couple of things that you might want to add. So firstly, early reflections. Uh, the delays in this feedback loop mean that there's a gap between your original sound and the earliest echoes that come through the wet signal. To bridge this gap, we can add a second sort of delay path with a multi-channel delay in it. And if, say, the delays in your feedback loop are between 100 and 200 milliseconds, then the delays in this early reflection path might be between 0 and 100 to kind of bridge that gap until the first echoes come through the feedback loop. And then you can mix this in whatever proportion makes sense. You can take it from the end of the diffuser, or you can take it from partway through if you want something that's a little earlier, maybe a little bit more coarse deliberately. Um, yeah, so that's early reflections. Uh, you can, in real spaces, another thing that happens is that small movements in the environment, just like air currents, produce subtle variations in delay times. In a feedback delay reverb, we can modulate the delay times to kind of emulate this, or we can crank it way past realism to get a very supernaturally thick sound. There's a couple of places you might want to modulate. You can modulate in the diffuser, or probably just one of the diffusion steps. And this gets you a kind of a chorus-like constant detuning. Um, or you can modulate within the feedback loop. And this means that the detuning, the thickness, will build up over time, which sounds 
really great, honestly. Um, oh, a little note. I have put the householder matrix in that feedback loop um, compared to the Hadamard and the others. Uh, I would recommend householder because it doesn't do too much mixing. Um, and from a technical perspective, I found that having too much mixing in that feedback loop, uh, it locks together the delays in, in a way and moves the eigentones of your matrix closer together in these gaps. Uh, but if none of that makes sense to you, no worries. It's a really small difference, um, and people might disagree with me. Another thing that real spaces do is that in a real space, high frequencies are often absorbed faster, and they have uh, shorter decay times. So we can achieve this in a feedback reverb using shelving filters. So in this feedback loop, the, the gain that we have determines how long the, the echoes last for, right? So if we put some filters right after that gain, we essentially get frequency-dependent gain. So that's how we get frequency-dependent uh, decay times. Uh, the way that, by the way, you calculate the delay time, I will, ooh, no, I'll show you in a bit how you calculate uh, the delay time given in RT60 or RT20 uh, in, in the code. Um, but yeah, so with, with these extra steps, the um, early reflections and the modulation and the filtering, you can get some pretty good sounds. So here is an example of a, here's one I made earlier. So that's just dry bass and piano, and then a bunch of reverb. So I think you get a nice enveloping sound once you add those extra little details to make it warmer and, and thicker. Uh, yeah. That's it. That was faster than I expect it to be. I think I've had too much coffee. <laughs> so just uh, I'll show you that the, the code for this is on, on GitHub. And you can, you can read through it. Here's what I talked about with the how you calculate RT60. You say, how long is one loop? How, much, how long should I take to decay 20, uh, 60 dB? and then say, how many dB should I decay per loop? It's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, so this is the main reverb. It's just we've put it through a diffuser and then the feedback. Um, this is our diffuser, a bunch of diffusion steps. Um, and we just stuff it through uh, sample by sample. Here's the, uh, the doubling or halving pattern that we used. Uh, that's another one. Ignore that one. Um, this is our diffusion step, which we saw earlier. So delay times, delays, flip polarities. This is how we do that um, sort of velvet-ish uh, delay time pattern. So you know, the first one is in the first section. The second one is between, oh, no, that's not, oh, don't look at the letter C. Um, between, you get the idea. You can read through the code. And then here is our... Uh, feedback loop. So you can see how short this reverb is, and hopefully the bits of it make sense. And one of the other problems that when you actually do this in real life is if you try and change in the parameters in this during runtime, you'll get clicks. But that's a whole other issue of how you smooth and fade things to make that happen. But the basic principles, hopefully, have been illustrated here, um, and you can get good results. So yeah, I'm really happy to uh, give this presentation at ADC, because I think reverb's a great and satisfying thing to mess around with, and I hope to share some of that joy and make it uh, something that people can feel confident to try. Um, I will say that, well, I think we're gonna, we've got loads of time for questions. Um, I do have to run home soon after this talk ends to go and take care of an infant, so if there are any questions uh, that you, you have, uh, oops. Let's just uh, skip to the end. Sorry, I'm going to hear all the audio examples again now. No, nope, we're good. There. That's what I get for writing my own presentation framework. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm on Discord. There's the fantastic The Audio Programmer Discord, and I hang out there a lot. Um,
I'm Signal Smith. I occasionally check Twitter, um, but you can always email me at Garant at Signal Smith Audio. Or I've got a unique name, so do just stalk me. Um, yeah, and get in touch, either if you have problems with this, this reverb and something's not working right, or just generally, because um, if you're doing something algorithmically created with audio, I'd love to have a chat with you. It's, I love this stuff. Yeah. Any questions? We do have some online questions, but maybe does it, is there a question in the room first? So, so your diffuser works by delay, lots, of, lots of delayed versions of your input audio, right? Yeah. But how do you stop that from radically affecting the frequency response? Of your... So this is what the nature of the all pass is. Uh, the idea of being energy preserving is whatever frequency you put in, in one channel, it's going to come out with the same energy in maybe later, maybe a different channel. But as long as that's, that's what the all pass guarantees, um, that you know, if you put in a pure tone, for example, you'll get a pure tone out with the same energy. So the frequency response should be flat, which is why we aimed for an all pass. Does that? Oh, yeah. So once you add the, the feedback loop, it's not an all pass. Yeah, so the feedback loop just extends the sound with echoes, and you minimize coloration there by having the delays quite long. Uh, so we create an all-pass diffuser, and then we put that into a feedback loop, which is not an all-pass, but it's, uh, it's hopefully not coloring just because the delays are quite long, because you can't really, you know, if, if you've got a 100 milliseconds delay, then, you know, your up, ups and down wiggles are going to be like 10 hertz big. Um, in your, and there's going to be eight of them, so it's going to be not predictable enough to, to register as coloration. Okay, I'm going to ask one question from our virtual audience. What are the technical and perceptual differences of a single long diffuser and two or more short diffusion steps? I mean, the way that we've constructed it, we've constructed our long diffuser out of short diffusion steps. Um, so, I mean... <laughs> This was also at the beginning, so right. maybe this... Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, but the point is that as long as your delays are sort of randomized or independent, um, then you don't need to make sure they're primer or anything. Just throw a random number generator at it. Um, and as long as the diffusion steps are independent, you can just stack them, and the sound will get more and more diffuse and smoother. So, yeah. And then I think I saw another hand over here. Exactly about um, uh, the choice of delay times. Uh, I agree that uh, choosing them randomly is a pretty good idea if you have enough of them because uh, 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 statistically you will not hit a, a, a bad case, yeah. but there are very bad cases of, uh, of, uh, of uh, delay time choices. Uh, here's a mathematical problem I've been struggling with for a long time. Is there an optimal uh, set of delays that will get you a very uh, 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 echo density, early echo density, the fastest. Um, yeah, so when people talk about this, they talk about that's when you have the prime delays. So if you make sure that all your delays are um, prime, then they won't exactly match up. There's also, oh, I can't remember the name, but there's something where it's like um, the, the golden ratio modulo something. No, oh, no. <laughs> um, what I'm. Uh, either prime nor uh, uh, the golden ratio is uh, good enough. Right. So <laughs> in terms of flat frequency response, um, the diffuser, it's flat regardless of what we choose. In terms of the feedback section, you talked about getting diffusion early. And I, <laughs> I, had, a, I, I, <laughs> I had a word of warning in there, um, the slide saying, I don't think that I like trying to get the feedback loop to diffuse as fast as possible. So that was uh, the actual problem. It is a hard problem. I agree with you, which is why in this design, we sidestepped it. <laughs> we don't diffuse as fast as possible in the feedback loop. We have a feedback loop. It's fine. And then we have a separate high quality diffuser to feed into it. Um, if you want to go the hardcore route, <laughs> Um, but that's not what I'm recommending here, and that's not what I personally like to do. So. Other questions in the front? 
So I don't know a lot about reverbs, but I know a little bit about differential equations. And I imagine reverberation in like a real room would be like nonlinear. So ah. do you do, uh, I mean, all this is linear. Do you do any nonlinear stuff in, rever in reverbs? You absolutely can, um, particularly if you, uh, if you can have unstable gains. So at the moment, and the feedback game is always less than one. You can have it greater than one and then have a clipper later and you'll get this big drone sounds and stuff. I will say that uh, in a good sounding room, uh, you shouldn't get nonlinear like wave shaping kind of stuff um, because that's generally like something rattling and that's not usually good. Um, you will get modulation and we have that and that is technically nonlinear because it'll change and shift over time. And that does happen in real spaces, and that's part of the richness and one of the drawbacks of convolution is that that's harder to do that modulation. Um, so, yeah, but this is the bare bones of a reverb. Try it. <laughs> Stick some, something nonlinear in there and uh, send it to me. I want to hear it. Okay, I wanted to pull one more from our virtual audience. Is there any reason to use arrays instead of a different data type for processing audio? Also, is it necessary to use stack rather than heap? Um, wow, deep question, yes. Um, no, I mean, optimization is a separate question I haven't really addressed here. So for example, even the flipping polarities, you could fold that into the matrix because that could be made as part of the matrix. You just inline all of that stuff and um, that gets a bit faster. Um, in stack, generally, if you use an array, you know it's fixed size, the compiler knows it's fixed size, and if you've got a smart compiler, it can start vectorizing stuff. So for, for things like the, um, if you've got some filters or something like that, uh, then it might be able to filter four channels at once in like big operations, uh, so it could be faster. Uh, that's, I, yeah, that, that's an optimization question, not an algorithmic one, um, but, on the subject of optimization, one of the advantages of this design uh, is the thing that normally kills block-based processing for reverbs is short feedback loops. If your blocks are five milliseconds long and you've got some really tight feedback loops that are one millisecond long, you can't, process, you can't push a whole block through. You have to split it up into one millisecond subblocks. Uh, that happens if you use Schroeder all passes. With this design, there is no feedback in the diffuser at all. So your diffuser can just, you can send massive blocks through it, and the only constraint is the delay times in your feedback, which are like 100 milliseconds long. Um, so th that wasn't the question, but I thought on the subject of that kind of optimization and like speed chasing, um, this is, even the naive implementation of this is pretty lightweight. I originally came up with this design because um, someone asked for a reverb lightweight enough they could use it in a sampler, with one instance per sample. Um, and I was like, right, let's go. Um, this is a, a distilled version of that design. And yeah, it, it performs pretty well. I know we had quite a few questions. Are there any more hands they think I saw over here? Let me go into the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you've um, partially answered it already, but I mean, right now what we have is sort of like an, an input-output relation, but how would you turn this into sensible parameters for users to tweak? Like where, where, would, you, where would you set the parameters here for the user to tweak? You mean uh, what the delay time should be in that kind of thing? Uh, no, sort of, sort of where, where they should be. <laughs> oh, like... Like what would you allow the user to tweak? Oh, right. So the things I would, I would let the user tweak, um, modulation amount, if you're um, using, well, filtering amount for like damping, because you, you filter more um, if you want it darker. Uh, so say it, if it decays by one dB per loop, if you add a shelving filter that takes the high end down by another dB, the high end will decay twice as fast. So that's, um, and they can crank that up and be four times, eight times. Um, uh, modulation, again, you can get it from this very dry thing uh, to something that's this really lush, uh, sort of uh, space-like uh, thing. Um, and yeah, early reflections, so you can sort of clear a space. Or pre-delay, which I haven't put in here. Um, another big one 
would be room size is a common thing to want to specify. Uh, it's always a bit ambiguous what that means in an algorithmic reverb. Uh, for me, what I've done is that determines the rough average length of the delays in the feedback loop. So you'd say a room size is 100 feet, and that means I would put my delay times between 100 and 200 milliseconds. Um, and then the diffusion step generally sized to kind of spread out one loop. So I'd get my total diffusion maybe around 100 milliseconds so that it makes up the gap from the shortest uh, route round. Um, yeah, I think there aren't that many other parameters in here that aren't randomly chosen. Uh, so, yeah. I think we have time for like two more questions. I know I saw one here. Thanks. Um, how would you go about adding um, like a shimmer effect into this kind of reverb design? Sure. Yeah. So um, in the feedback loop, you could add a shimmer there. And much like the modulation, pretty much, uh, uh, where are we? Yeah. So everything you might want to add to a reverb, it's the same shape as this, or the filtering. It's like, if you want to build up over time, put a pitch shifter with a little wet dry mix. So each time it goes around the loop, it gets a little bit more shifted up, and then it'll add up you know, two octaves, three octaves. Or you can have a one-off shimmer at the start, and then sort of blend that in however you like. Um, yeah, so all, all, all sorts of creative stuff like shimmer or nonlinear things um, can be done in basically these two places. Uh, yeah. Questions on this side? Maybe here in the middle? It's an ideal location. <laughs> Why don't why don't you ask the question and then you and repeat, repeat the question? Yeah. Um, okay, just in the previous question about parameters, do you ever make some extra changes? Like, how important is it to make sure that you do that because if there's no way to implement the change, I guess, does it have to be in the house or do you change it to implement that make sure that that's the Yeah, so the question was, uh, if I understand it, uh, when you're sort of, you've got your matrices, um, how whether you can have other matrices or like matrices with different parameters in them. Um, for the diffuser, I would recommend Hadamard because you just want the maximum amount of mixing. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think you can you can really do better than Hadamard in that situation because it's just well, if you look at it, it's all ones plus a multiplying factor. Um, in the in the feedback loop, uh, yeah, it, any as long as it's orthogonal, um, and there are ways you can construct. Uh, any a family of matrices that are like Hadamard-like or various other things. So you could have a dial that goes from no matrix at all to Hadamard. Um, I don't know how to explain it right now because I need a whiteboard, but um, yeah, there's that, that's the parameter you could, you could tweak as well for people who really want to tune that sound. On this side, any more hands? Hi. Uh, very probably mild question. Um, the, have you got any opinion or experience on sort of hybrid reverberators, where the early reflections are convolution and then it goes into like something like a feedback delay network? Yeah, it's cool because the, uh, I t totally, so hybrid stuff is great because um, the early reflections are tricky and also provide a lot of the character of the sound. In any space, once it's been reverberating long enough, it turns into this big mush. Um, and if you want to really capture the, the, the essence of a room, you probably want to just capture the room and then kind of fade that out as the other uh, stuff comes in. So you'd kind of do that maybe in place of the early reflection section uh, that we had here. So instead of those delays, you would have something that goes straight from the input to a convolver and then is mixed in the output. Um, yeah, that's definitely a thing. And then one last question from our online audience. How far have you pushed this algorithm? For example, number of channels, delay lengths, et cetera. So because the situations where I've been using this have mostly been uh, low CPU, so uh, either in, it's sort of on, on a phone or something where you don't have a huge amount of as much processing power as a high-end desktop, or this thing where you wanted loads of instances of it. Um, I haven't used it really with more than eight. Like, I've tried it with 16, but um, 
if you have enough diffusion, eight is fine. Um, yeah, but like, yeah, it, put it up to 16 or whatever, or I think more than that is probably just taking the mickey. Um, what I will say is that the two halves don't have to have the same amount of channels. So I have done before a bunch of four channel diffusers in a row, and then I duplicate that again to get eight channels for the feedback loop. But you know that's all just playing around. Um, I just because I don't want to do it the same each time. Uh, but yeah, I haven't personally used it more than eight channels in real life. But go for it. Tell me if you can hear a difference. <laughs> 